Hello. We are looking now at the airy disc. This has to do with optics and physics. So if you like physics and optics, cool. If you don't, cool. And just scanning through it, doesn't look like until later in mathematical formulation does it get too physics heavy. Um, we'll see how I'm feeling when I get there as to whether or not I actually get into that. So the airy disc. Let's go. In optics, the airy disc, or disc spelled with a C, and airy pattern are descriptions of the best focused spot of light that a perfect lens with a circle circular aperture can make, limited by the diffraction of light. The airy disk is, is of importance in physics, optics, and astronomy. The diffraction pattern resulting from a uniformly illuminated circular aperture has a bright central region known as the airy disk, which together with the series of concentric rings around it is called the airy pattern. Both are named after George Biddle Airy. Sorry, that was a short sentence. Both are named after George Biddle Airy, which I'm actually surprised by. I thought Airy was just kind of like, ah, yeah, look, it's kind of an airy little thing. Well, the disc and rings phenomenon had been known prior to Airy. John Herschel, uh, sorry, yeah, had been known prior, like before Airy was around. I thought it was like before, before he... Uh, Discovered it, he knew about it. No kidding. Okay, John Herschel described the appearance of a bright star seen through a telescope under high magnification for an 1828 article on light for the Encyclopedia Metropolitana. He said, The star is then seen in favorable, favorable circumstances of tranquil atmosphere, uniform temperature, etc., as a perfectly round, well defined, I cannot talk, well defined planetary disk. Surrounded by two, three, or more, or more alternately dark and bright rings, which, if examined attentively, are seen to be slightly colored at their borders. They succeed each other neatly at equal intervals round the central disk. And is this the same John Herschel? No, okay. Sorry, I'm trying to see. There's another Herschel that was a scientist, I think a little earlier, that also made some fun music. Or maybe in about that same time range. I forget the first name, though. Oh, well. Doink. Doink. Cool. Airy wrote the first full theoretical treatment explaining the phenomenon. His 1835 on the diffraction of an object glass with circular aperture. That's where he <laughs> wrote the first full theoretical treatment. Cool. Mathematically, the diffraction pattern is characterized by the wavelength of light illuminating the circular aperture and the aperture size. The appearance of the diffraction pattern is additionally characterized by the sensitivity of the eye or other detector used to observe the pattern. Again, the appearance of this diffraction pattern is characterized by the sensitivity of the eye or other detector used to observe the pattern. The most important application of this concept is in cameras, microscopes, and telescopes. Due to diffraction, the smallest point to which a lens or mirror can focus a beam of light is the size of the airy disk. And I am going to read that. Wait, hold on. I'm sorry, my uh, Spotify playlist just uh, changed on me and went to something like ASMR, -y, which made it seem like there was something else making sound in my room. Okay. Um, yeah, due to diffraction, the smallest point to which a lens or a mirror can focus a beam of light is the size of the airy disk, which I think we'll see in math down there. Oh, that is not typeset. Okay. Even if one were able to make a perfect lens, there is still a limit to the resolution of an image created by such a lens. An optical system in which the resolution is no longer limited by imperfections in the lenses, but only by diffraction, is said to be diffraction limited. Size. 
Far from the aperture, the angle at which the first minimum occurs, measured from the direction of incoming light, is given by the approximate formula sine theta is approximately 1.22 times lambda over d, um, where lambda is wavelength of light in meters and d is the diameter of the aperture in meters. Or for small angles, this is simplified to just theta is approximately 1.22 lambda over d. And theta is in radians here. The full width at half maximum is given by theta of full width at half maximum equals 1.025 lambda over d. Airy wrote this relation as s equals 2.76 over a, where s was the angle of first minimum in seconds of arc, a was the radius of the aperture in inches, in, in inches sorry, and the wavelength of light was assumed to be uh, 560 nanometers, which uh, is visible wavelengths. This is equal to the angular resolution of a circular aperture. Um, I don't actually remember how this is pronounced. I've heard it different ways. The Rayleigh, or Raleigh, I don't know. The Rayleigh criterion for barely resolving two objects that are point sources of light, such as stars seen through a telescope, is that the center of the airy disk Sorry, is that cent is that the center? Yeah, I'm saying this right. Um, Rayleigh criterion for barely resolving two objects is that the center of the airy disk for the first object occurs at the first minimum of the airy disk of the second. This means that the angular resolution of a diffraction limited system is given by the same formulae. However, while the angle at which the first minimum occurs, which is sometimes described as the radius of the airy disk, depends only on wavelength and aperture size, the appearance of the diffraction pattern will vary with the intensity or brightness of the light source. Because any detector, eye, film, or digital, used to observe the diffraction pattern can have an intensity threshold for detection, the full diffraction pattern may not be apparent. In astronomy, the outer rings are frequently not apparent even in a highly magnified image of a star. It may be that none of the rings are apparent, in which case the star image appears as a disk, central maximum only, rather than as a full diffraction pattern. Furthermore, fainter stars will appear as smaller disks than brighter stars, because less of their central maximum reaches the threshold of detection. While in theory all stars or other point sources of, of a given wavelength and seen through a given aperture have the same airy disk radius characterized by the above equation and the same diffraction pattern size, differing only in, in intensity, the appearance is that fainter sources appear as smaller disks and brighter sources appear as larger disks. That's quite fascinating. Let me see if Airy makes this succinct here. He says, the rapid decrease of light in the successive rings will sufficiently explain the visibility of two or three rings with a very bright star and the non-visibility of rings with a faint star. The difference of the diameters of the central spots or spurious disks of different stars is also fully explained. Thus, the radius of the spurious disk of a faint star where light, where, yeah, sorry, where light of less than half the intensity of the central light makes no impression on the eye. Is determined by s equals 1.17 over a, whereas the radius of the spurious disk of a bright star, where light of one-tenth the intensity of the central light is sensible, is determined by s equals 1.97 over a. So no, he doesn't really uh, make it more clear or succinct. Despite this feature of Aries' work, the radius of the airy disk is often given as being simply the angle of first minimum, even in standard textbooks. In reality, the angle of first minimum is a limiting value for the size of the airy disk, not a definite radius. So let me just read this other part up here again. Um, it may be that none of the rings are apparent, in which, the case, in which case the star image appears as a bright rather than as a full diffraction pattern. Furthermore, fainter stars, fainter stars will appear as smaller disks than brighter stars because less of their central maximum reaches the threshold of detection. While in theory all stars or other point sources of a given wavelength, i.e. light, uh, and seen through a given aperture, i.e. camera, eyeball, whatever, have the same airy disk radius characterized by the above 
um, equation s equals 2.76 2.76 over a um, differing only in intensity the appearance is that fainter sources appear as smaller disks and brighter sources appear as larger disks <clears throat> Examples, cameras. If two, uh, sorry, if two objects imaged by a camera are separated by an angle small enough that their, that their airy disks on the camera detector start overlapping, the objects cannot be clearly separated any more in the image and they start blurring together. Two objects are said to be just resolved when the maximum of the first airy pattern falls on top of the first minimum of the second airy pattern, that is the Rayleigh criterion. Therefore, the smallest angle, angular separation two objects can have before they significantly blur together, as said above, is sine theta, sine theta equals 1.22 lambda over d. Thus, the ability of a system to resolve detail is limited by the ratio of lambda over d. The larger the aperture for a given wavelength, the finer the detail can be distinguished in the image, thus theta over d. This can also be described as x over f equals 1.22 lambda over d where x is the separation of the images of the two objects on the film, and f is the distance from the lens to the film. If we take the distance from the lens to the film to be approximately equal to the focal length of the lens, we find x equals 1.22 lambda, sorry, lambda f over d. But f over d is the f number of a lens. I'm not familiar with f number is a measure of the light gathering ability of an optical system such as a camera lens. It is calculated by dividing the system's focal length by the diameter of the entrance pupil. F number is also known as focal ratio, F ratio, or F stop, and it is key to determining the depth of field and a couple other things. A typical setting for use on an overcast day would be F over six. For violet, the shortest wavelength visible light, um, sorry, yeah, for violet, the shortest wavelength of visible light, the wavelength lambda is about 420 nanometers. This, val this gives a value of x, sorry, gives a value for x of about 4 micrometers. In a digital camera, making the pixels of the image sensor smaller than half this value, one pixel for each object, for, for each object, one for each space between, would not significantly increase the captured image resolution. However, it may improve the final image by oversampling, allowing noise reduction. In the human eye, the fastest thing, the fastest F number for the human eye is about 2.1, corresponding to a diffraction-limited point spread function with approximately one micrometer diameter. However, at this F number, spherical aberration limits visual acuity while a 3 millimeter pupil diameter, which is f over 5.7, approximates the resolution achieved by the human eye. The maximum density of cones in the human fovea, fovea? Ooh, eye stuff, is approximately 170,000 per square millimeter, which implies that the cone spacing in the human eye is about 2.5 micrometers, approximately the diameter of the point spread function at f over 5. Let me show some images real quick. This is a computer-generated image of an airy disk. The grayscale intensities have been adjusted to enhance brightness of the outer rings of the airy pattern. A computer-generated airy disk from diffracted white light. The red component is diffracted more than the blue component so that the center appears slightly bluish. Oopsie, I accidentally clicked the image. Yeah, it does appear bluish. A real airy disk created by passing a red laser beam through a 90 micrometer pinhole aperture with 27 orders of diffraction. Look at all those disks. Hmm. Airy disk captured by 200 millimeter cam camera lens at five, or sorry, at f over 25 aperture. This image is a one by one millimeter. This is a log log plot of aperture diameter versus angular resolution at the diffraction limit for various light wavelengths compared with various astronomical instruments. If you wish to read that in better detail, knock your socks off, but I honestly don't care to. Longitudinal sections through a focused beam with a negative on top, a zero in the center, and a positive on the bottom, spherical apparition. 
The lens is to the left. Cool. Um, you are more than welcome to pause and read this little blip on focused laser beam and aiming sight. Conditions for observation. Light from a uniformly illuminated circular aperture or from a uniform flat top beam will exhibit an area diffraction pattern far away from the aperture due to Fraunhofer diffraction, which is far field diffraction. The conditions for being in the far field and exhibiting an area pattern are the incoming light illuminating the aperture is a plane wave, so no phase variation across the aperture, and the intensity is constant over the area of the aperture, and the distance r from the aperture where the diffracted light is observed, the screen distance, is large compared to the aperture side, and the radius a of the aperture is not too much larger than the wavelength lambda, wavelength lambda of the light. The last two conditions can be formally written as r greater than a squared over lambda. In practice, the conditions for uniform illumination can be met by placing the source of the illumination far from the aperture. If the conditions for far field are not met, for example if the aperture is too large, the far field area diffraction pattern can also be obtained on a screen much closer to the aperture by using a lens right after the aperture, or the lens itself can form the aperture. The area pattern will then be formed at the focus of the lens rather than at infinity. Hence, the focal spot on a uniform circular laser beam, a flat top beam, focused by a lens will also be an area pattern. In a camera or imaging system, an object far away gets imaged onto the film or detector plane by the objective lens, and the, and the far field diffraction pattern is observed at the detector. The resulting image is a convolution of the ideal image with the, with the area diffraction pattern due to diffraction from the iris aperture or due to the finite size of the lens. This leads to the finite resolution of a lens system described above. Here's some math. The mathematical formulation. How long is this? Ugh. Okay, yeah, we can get through this. The intensity of the airy pattern follows the Fraunhofer diffraction pattern of a circular aperture given by the squared modulus of the Fourier transform of the circular aperture. So I have theta equals I naught, 2j1, 2, sorry, 2j sub 1. Okay, let me start this over in case you're not watching. I naught times 2j sub 1 times k a sine theta over k a sine theta. That squared, not the I naught. I naught is within that. Starting from 2j, yeah, squared is 2j sub 1 k a sine theta over k a sine theta. And this equals I naught times, I guess we could say this part is squared, 2j, 2j sub 1 times x over x. And in this, I naught is the maximum intensity of the pattern at the, the airy disk center. J sub 1 is the Bessel function of the first kind of order 1. I'm not familiar with the Bessel function. This is first defined by Daniel Bernoulli and then generalized by Friedrich Bessel. Our canonical solutions, y of x of Bessel's differential equation. I hope it gives it here. Differential equation being x squared d2y over dx squared plus x dy over dx plus x squared minus alpha squared times y equals 0 for an arbitrary complex number alpha, which represents the order of the Bessel function. Although alpha and negative alpha produce the same differential equation, it is conventional to define different Bessel functions for these two values in such a way that the Bessel functions are mostly smooth functions of alpha. And Bessel functions describe the radial part of vibrations of a circular membrane as shown here. Cool. MATLAB. Maybe. Um, just looking at some applications of the Bessel function. It says the Bessel function is a generalization of the sine function. It can be interpreted as the vibration of a string with variable thickness, variable tension, or both conditions simultaneously. Vibrations in a medium with variable properties, vibrations of the disk membrane, etc. Bessel's, Bessel's equation arises when finding separable solutions to Laplace's equation into the Helmholtz equation in cylindrical or spherical coordinates. 
Bessel functions are therefore especially important for many problems of wave propagation and static potentials. In solving problems in cylindrical coordinate systems, one obtains Bessel functions of integer order alpha equals n. In spherical problems, one obtains half integer orders alpha equals n plus one half. For example, we've got EM waves in cylindrical waveguide, pressure amplitudes of inviscid rotational flows, heat conduction in a cylindrical object, modes of vibration of a thin circular and or sorry or annular acoustic membrane like a drumhead or a member membranophone, um, thick sheets of plate metal, diffusion problems on a lattice, solutions to the radial Schrödinger equation for a free particle, positron, sorry, that's not positron, that's position space representation of the Feynman propagator in quantum field theory, solving for, pro for patterns of acoustical radiation, frequency dependent friction in circular pipelines, dy dynamics of floating bodies, angular resolution, hey, diffraction from helical objects, including DNA, probability density function, or sorry, probability density function of product of two normally distributed random variables, Analyzing of the surface waves generated by micro tremors and geophysics and seismology. So that is just a real brief look at the Bessel function. I'm sure if you deal with this stuff often, this makes more sense. I mean, that basic differential equation is easy enough. Again, that's x squared uh, times d2y over dx squared plus x dy over dx plus x squared minus alpha squared times y equals zero. That's straightforward enough. Um, yeah, so um, the intensity, again, of the airy pattern follows the Fraunhofer diffraction pattern of a circular aperture given by squared modulus as a Fourier transform of the circular aperture, which we said i of theta equals i naught times uh, 2 j sub 1 x over x squared where I naught is the maximum intensity of the pattern at the airy disk center. J sub one is the Bessel function. That's it, J sub one is the Bessel function of the first kind of order one, that alpha. K equals two pi over lambda is the wave number. Um, A is the radius of the aperture and theta is the angle of observation. So the angle between the axis of the circular aperture and the line between aperture center and observation point. X equals Ka sine theta equals K, we've got 2 pi over lambda, so equals 2 pi, sorry, yeah, 2 pi A over lambda times Q over R, that is little Q, by the way, and big R, where little Q is the radial distance from the observational point to the optical axis, and big R is its distance to the aperture. Note that the airy disk as given by the above expression is only valid for large R where uh, Fraunhofer diffraction applies. Calculation of the shadow in the near field must, ra must rather be handled using Frenzel diffraction. And here's a quick little look. Diffraction from a circular aperture. The area pattern is observable when, do you have anything else to say? Observable? Yeah, it doesn't uh, like typesetting in captions. It is observable when big R is much greater than A squared over lambda. Here's A, so imagine that squared. R here has to be much greater than A, the aperture radius squared times lambda. Wait, times are over. Sorry, 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 sorry. Over lambda. A squared over lambda. Cool, where was I? Here we are. Uh, however, the exact airy pattern does appear at a finite distance if a lens is placed at the aperture. Then the airy pattern will be perfectly focused at the distance given by the lens focal length, assuming collimated light incident on the aperture, given by the above equations. The zeros of j1 of k, which is the Bessel function, that's the function of k, uh, sorry, the zeros of j1 of x, which is the Bessel function as a function of x, are at x equals k a sine theta, which is approximately 3.8, 7.0, 10.1, or rather 10.2, 13.3, and 16.5. From this, and so on, <laughs> for uh, different values. Um, from this, it follows that the first dark ring in the diffraction pattern occurs where k a sine theta equals 3.8, or sine theta equals 3.8, 3, yeah, they, they go to to more significant figures, uh, yeah, sorry, more significant figures. So 
when sine theta is approximately equal to 3.83 over ka, or 3.83 lambda over 2 pi a, plugging in for k, uh, or 1.22 lambda over 2a, and thus we get 1.22 lambda over d. Cool, cool, cool. If a lens is, that actually is a fun little quick derivation of, of sorts. If a lens is used to focus the airy pattern at a finite distance, then the radius little q of 1, sub 1, of the first dark ring on the focal plane is solely given by the numerical aperture big A, closely related to the f number, by little q sub 1 equals big R sine theta 1, um, approximately equal to 1.22 big R lambda over d equals 1.22 lambda over 2 big A. Um, cool. Let's see this image. Diffraction from an aperture with a lens. The far field image will only be formed at the screen one focal length away, where, where big R equals f and f is the focal length. The observation angle theta stays the same in the lensless case. And that's what we've got there. Mm -mm -mm. Okay. Focal length. Dun, dun, dun. Okay. Dun, 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 dun. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, let's see. Where the numerical aperture big A, I'll just say A, there are no other A's right now, is equal to the aperture's radius, d over 2, divided by big R prime, the distance from the center of the airy pattern to the edge of the aperture. Oh, that was positive or whatever. Um, viewing the aperture of radius d over 2 and lens as a camera, uh, projecting an image onto a focal plane at distance f, the numerical aperture a is related to the commonly cited f number, n equals f over d, ratio of the focal length to the lens diameter, according to a equal to little r over big R prime equals little arm over square root f squared plus r squared, and that is little r squared, equal to 1 over square root of 4 big n squared plus 1. And this is for n uh, value much greater than 1. Um, oh, no, I'm sorry. For n value much greater than 1, it is simply approximated as a equals roughly 1 over 2n. This shows that the best possible image resolution of a camera is limited by the numerical aperture, and thus f number, of its lens due to diffraction. The half maximum of the central airy disk, where 2j of 1, sorry, 2j's of 1 of x over x equals 1 over root 2, occurs at x equals 1.6. Um, I don't care to read the rest there. The intensity, i naught at the center of the diffraction pattern is related to the total power, p naught incident on the aperture by i naught equals e squared, or sorry, e sub a squared times a squared over 2 big R squared which is equal to p naught, the total power, times a over lambda squared times r squared, where e is the source strength per unit area at the aperture, a is the area of the aperture, um, pi a squared, and r is the distance from the aperture. Um, let's see where I care. J naught, j1 are vessel functions. Cool, cool, cool. Area disk and diffraction pattern can be computed numerically, from first principles using Feynman's path integrals, area pattern on the integral, or sorry, on the interval k a sine theta from minus 10 to 10. It's easy enough looking. Typical wave. The encircled power graphed next to the intensity. Yep, yep, yep. That's all familiar if you've uh, done waves studies. Approximation using a Gaussian profile. The airy pattern falls rather slowly to zero with increasing distance from the center, with the outer rings containing a significant portion of the integrated intensity of the pattern. As a result, the root mean square spot size is undefined. An alternative measure of the spot size is to ignore the relatively small outer rings of the airy pattern and to approximate the central lobe with a Gaussian profile, such that I of Q is approximately I naught prime exponent uh, minus 2 little q squared over omega naught squared, where 
I naught prime is the irradiance at the center of the pattern. Q represents the radial distance from the center of the pattern. And omega naught is the Gaussian RMS width in one dimension. If we equate the peak amplitude of the area pattern and Gaussian profile, that is I naught prime equals I naught, and find the value of omega naught giving the optimal approximation to the pattern, we obtain omega naught approximately equal to 0 0.84 lambda n, where n is the f number. If, on the other hand, we wish to enforce that the Gaussian profile has the same volume as does the area pattern, then this becomes omega naught equals approximately 0 0.9 lambda n. In optical aberration, aberration theory, it is common to describe an imaging system as diffraction limited if the area disk radius is larger than the RMS spot size determined from geometric ray tracing. The Gaussian profile approximation provides an alternative means of comparison. Using the approximation above shows that the Gaussian waste, omega naught, of the Gaussian approximation to the airy disk is about two-thirds the airy disk radius, um, so 0 0.84 lambda n as opposed to 1.22 lambda n. Obscured airy pattern. Similar equations can also be derived from the obscured airy diffraction pattern which is the diffraction pattern from an annular aperture or beam. In other words, a uniform circular aperture obscured by a circular block at the center. Uh, this situation is relevant to many common reflector telescope designs that incorporate a secondary mi mirror, including Newtonian telescopes and schmidt cassegrain telescopes. So in this we have I of R equals I naught over one minus epsilon squared squared times 2 j sub 1 of x over x minus 2 epsilon j sub 1 of epsilon x over x squared, where epsilon is the annular aperture obscuration ratio, or the ratio of the diameter of the obscuring disk and the diameter of the aperture beam. This is starting to get a little lost on me. I'm not much into optics. Um, and let's see, 0 is less than or equal to epsilon is less than one, and x is defined as above, x equals k a sine theta, um, which is approximately equal to pi r over lambda n, where r is radial distance in the focal plane from the optical axis, you get the rest. The fractional encircled energy, which is the fraction of the total energy contained with, within a circle of radius r, centered at the optical axis in the focal plane, is given by E of R equals 1 over 1 minus epsilon squared times 1 minus J naught squared of X minus J sub 1 squared of X plus epsilon squared times 1 minus J naught squared of epsilon X minus J1 squared of epsilon, uh, sorry, of epsilon times X, all that minus 4 epsilon times the integral from 0 to X of J1 of T j1 of epsilon t over t dt. Yeah, okay, it's a mouthful. Um, okay, let's just read this. The practical effect of having a central uh, obstruction in a telescope is that the central disk becomes slightly smaller and the first bright ring becomes brighter at the expense of the central disk. Key. That's, that's good. There we go. This becomes more problematic with short focal length telescopes, which require larger secondary mirrors. Okay, we are just about done. Um, comparison to Gaussian beam focus. Ah, I don't actually care to read that. Elliptical aperture, the Fourier integral of the circular cross section of radius A is integral 0 to a r dr times integral 0 to pi d phi times e to the i k dot r those are vectors k vector dot r vector uh, equals the integral from 0 to a r dr integral 0 to 2 pi d phi times e to the i k r cosine phi not vectors equals 2 times the integral from 0 to a r dr um, times the integral from 0 to pi not 2 pi anymore, to pi d phi times cosine of k r cosine phi, which that equals 2 pi, the integral from 0 to a, r dr, of j naught uh, of k r, sorry, uh, that r dr times j naught k 
of kr equals finally 2 pi over a nope messed that up finally equals 2 pi times a over k times j1 of kr sorry that was a lot in my brain this is a special case of the Fourier integral of the elliptical cross section with half axes a and b um, and then we also have here the integral um, x squared sorry the integral of x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared when less than or equal to 1 integral um, function e to the i k of x x times e to the i k of y y dx dy equals 2 pi times a b over c times j1 of c where c is defined by the square root of k of x times a squared plus k of y times b squared <laughs> that's all that then i hope some of that if not made sense was at least interesting i don't care to um do a sum up because i don't fully understand all of it myself um here are other c also's apodization front hard diffraction bloom shader effect oh computer graphics newton's rings optical unit point spread function psf debbie share ring I, I never know if it's debbie or dubai strel ratio and speckle pattern i won't be reading any of that for the foreseeable future. Goodbye.